And Matt, we do have this big infrastructure plan, uh, precious little in it about agriculture, uh, but just hitting a really important point that was, I think, only laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's this concept of, uh, not everyone may have heard this term, I hadn't until recently, the food deserts. Uh, these are places where uh, there is very little access to healthy, affordable food. Some 23 and a half million people live in food deserts, just for context. That's uh, but two-thirds of the Canadian population, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and these folks have to rely on things like fast food for their food. So uh, obviously an issue of inequity, an issue of health, uh, and, and an issue that will go right to the heart of, uh, of some of the poverty issues facing North America. Absolutely. I mean, um, if you're in a place where there isn't fresh food on offer and you're hungry, um, you're not likely to travel far and wide to try and get something. And I actually have a great friend in Ohio aptly named Jim Green, who's been really trying to work on this urban farming initiative, but the funding is just difficult to get. So I'm excited to talk to our next guest, Kimball Musk, joins us. You may recognize the name. Of course, he is Elon Musk's brother. And he's taking the kind of uh, Musk initiative and creativity to try and find a solution to this problem um, that's really, I guess, not only a problem in America, but around the world. He is the co-founder and executive chairman of Big Green. So, Kimball, thanks for joining us. Um, let me first ask, you know, how you recognize this problem and what kind of ideas you have to try and change it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, we, we recognize this problem uh, many years ago, of course, obesity and diabetes has been a real disaster for, for America, especially in lower income communities, as, as you mentioned, those food deserts where you don't have access to healthy, affordable food. Uh, but in COVID, the, those were the people who were most susceptible. And so Anyone who had a, a, a comorbidity with diabetes had a much higher uh, uh, rate of rate of fatality than than others. I mean, it was a cruel part of the COVID epidemic that that we faced in America this past year, and the rest of the world is facing it because not not we're we're hopefully getting out of the woods here, but the rest of the world is 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 going to face this. And anyone who has uh, has unfortunately got got. Um, only access to fast food, high calorie, low nutrition food that causes obesity and diabetes is 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 really going to suffer the hardest in uh, through this pandemic. And so, what we created, it, we created this last year in partnership with some nonprofits. Um, we started giving away gardens to uh, families in these low income communities. These are 12 inches wide, 12 inches deep, small gardens. Uh, this spring, we did potatoes where where with this, they're seeded and. Uh, within a couple of months, you'll literally be digging for potatoes like you dig for gold. It's a beautiful, beautiful way mm -hmm. to connect your kids to food, eat, you know, eat your own food, and you, have to, you can actually grow a lot of food. And uh, in partnership with uh, Modern Farmer, which is now a nonprofit, it's a, uh, the, the magazine has, has become a nonprofit, Frank Justra, Harrison Ford, Selma Hayek, these amazing celebrities, Zoe Deschanel, Eve the Rapper, Jonathan Scott in Canada, a wonderful group of people that have come together to promote this idea of getting gardens into homes in low-income communities. Um, people can donate by yeah. donating $10 and help support this at milliongardensmovement.org. Um, and we really want corporations to participate. We want companies who feel like this is a part of their mission to go to milliongardensmovement.org and help support the movement. And uh, one thing that comes to my mind, Kimball, is, uh, is it's such a great idea, and obviously you've been passionate about this for a long time. Does it get at that inequity we were talking about? And the, and the reason that I ask that is I think gardening as something that is uh, takes a lot of time, which is not something that uh, poorer households have much of. So how do we square those two factors, uh, that there, it's a real kind of commitment of time and energy uh, for people that may not have it? Well, you know, the, we, we've actually found that lower-income families are very excited to, to garden. Uh, we've been working in South Chicago, South Memphis, uh, parts of uh, the lower-income parts of Denver, L.A., uh, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Indianapolis. We've been deeply in these communities for years. And, and when, we, when we announced the, the little, we call them the little green gardens, you know, these are, we're going to try and get millions of these out there. Um, we announced them to our communities. We did a test in Chicago. We did a test in Memphis. We did it with 5,000 gardens in Chicago and uh, 1,500 in Memphis. 
we had them in a socially distant way lined up around blocks to get them. So they, they found the time because gardening at home is not just about food, it's about mental health, it's about connecting with your kids. It's a beautiful way to spend your time and it's actually not that much time. Once you get over that intimidation right. factor, um, and, and frankly, there, there are times when things don't go well, you really do have to look after your garden, mm. but it's not a time thing. It's more about that sort of um, mental and frankly, therapeutic commitment to, I'm gonna look after my garden and if I look after it, it's gonna thrive.